Okay, we're live. Uh, I'm, I am starting this thing kind of right away uh, and not really waiting for a ton of people to get online because uh, I, I don't have a ton of time, but I just wanted to do a quick live and give you an update on where I've been and what I've been doing. I'm uh, kind of out on the bleeding edge of cell phone service and uh, that sort of thing. So I, I'm not sure how good the connection will be, but if you can hear me, uh, please leave a comment in the comments there of where you're, where you're listening from. Uh, then I'll go back and watch that uh, afterwards, take a look at it. Uh, and so uh, good, to, good to see all of you that are coming online. Uh, thank you for, for coming on. I'm in the Darien Gap. <clears throat> Uh, the Darien Gap, for those that don't know, is the border between Panama and Colombia. Uh, I'm on the Panama side. The border is about, the, depending on where you are, 70 miles wide or so. And uh, it is, it, it does, it's basically the only place in between North and South America uh, where there are no roads. Uh, the the road from the United States goes from Alaska all the way down. They call it the Pan American Highway. And it ends in the Darien Gap. And then on the other side in Colombia, it picks back up again and goes all the way to Argentina. Now, why is there no road between Panama and Colombia? Well, it's because of the Darien jungle. It is the most extreme topography on earth, more or less. Uh, it that they say it would be impossible for them to actually build a road through there and it would not certainly not cost effective to do so not only that but they kind of don't want a road through there because it would only make it easier for the drug trade it would make it easier for the migration and it would make it easier for uh, parasites and diseases to be transferred between South America and North America Things that have been eradicated in North America are still a problem in some places in South America, like hoof and mouth disease. And if they, if there was an easy pathway for commerce between the two countries, then uh, that might not be a, the case. We might have to uh, worry more about um, cattle in the United States, for example, getting diseases that have been eradicated long ago and that would lead to the destruction of millions of cattle, so it wouldn't be good for, for our economy. Uh, right now, though, there is a superhighway of people coming through the Darien Gap. Uh, they are from around the world. Uh, they're not, most of them are maybe from the Western Hemisphere, if you count Venezuelans, Cubans, and Haitians. Uh, but other than that, we are seeing tremendous number of Chinese, people from Africa, uh, India, Bangladesh. Hey, how's it going? Here's some. Where are you from? Ethiopia. I knew it. I knew it. Yes, I can see. Very beautiful people. Beautiful. How long have you been here? No, no. You just got here. Oh, taxi. Uh, there's a bus that's going down there right now. Go around the corner and down the road. This bus. The, the, the bus with all the painting on it, all the pictures on it, okay? It's a school bus. School bus. School bus, yeah. Uh, there's no, it's, it's down this road. I just saw it go down there, but they go back and forth. So try that. Okay. Uh, so these guys over here, uh, there's some Ethiopian guys. They just came in. Uh, they, they walked through the Darien Gap and have just arrived in Panama. Now that walk uh, can go a couple days if you have some money, or it can go up to six days or more if you don't have money. And either way, it's dangerous, it's miserable, it's uh, you know absolutely uh, just just terrible. It's a terrible uh, journey. Everyone who has done it will tell you, I would never do that again in a million years. Um, Many people die in the jungle. Uh, probably at one point we determined that probably one out of 10 that go in don't come out again. Now that number is much lower because the total number of people is much higher and they can, um, 
you know, take care of each other a little bit better. There's more infrastructure in there. It sounds like it's absolutely trackless jungle, uh, but it's not trackless. Uh, there are, there's basically a, just a wide freeway going through that jungle. Um, and that, that wide freeway uh, is not paved. It's just a pedestrian parkway. <laughs> they, they've been walking through there so long that there are trails everywhere in there. And because there are so many people, that's going to draw commerce. And so there are people living in the jungle now who take advantage of the migrants uh, and sell them food, sell them water, sell them camping gear, uh, give them guiding services, and or rob them and rape them and even kill them in some cases. It's a lawless area in there for the most part. And so pretty much anything goes. These are not, I mean, those two guys that just, I was talking to just now are, were, were not, those guys are military age males, but there are tons of women. There are children, pregnant ladies, babies being carried through there. Can you imagine carrying a 10 month old baby uh, through uh, walking six days through the most difficult and dangerous jungle on earth? Uh, the, the, mindset of the people that are coming through there is just absolutely heartbreaking. Um, the, what makes it more heartbreaking is that, thank you, Connie. I, I just noticed there, thank you for the, the, the donation. I appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Um, the, the mindset of the people coming through there might tend to make you think that yeah, they're so desperate. They'll just do anything to get, get in there, and in some sense they are, but that desperation comes not out of um, a, you know, living standard or a, a misery that they've been facing where they came from necessarily. Many of them left jobs, had houses. Uh, they, they come through here with iPhones, with nice clothing and shoes, at least when they get started. And so they're, they're not, completely destitute. And in fact, even the poorest people who come through here end up having to pay several hundred dollars to get through the jungle uh, because they, they have to pay like, you know, protection fees to the bandits that would otherwise rob them and rape them. Uh, and they get robbed. And then when they get out to this side of the jungle, they have to pay the Indians that live in the jungle to give them a boat ride out to the road here where I just, I just arrived now. Yesterday we went up river uh, deep into the Darien Gap, almost uh, about halfway into the Darien Gap to the first Panamanian settlement that you come across as you're coming from Colombia once you've crossed the border into Panama. It's a place called Canaan Membrillo. It was four and a half hours riding in a dugout canoe with a outboard motor on it, upriver, 27 miles into the jungle, uh, and about 300 vertical feet of elevation uh, as we went upstream. I was very surprised to find out it was 300 vertical feet of elevation because it feels like it's a flat river the whole way, but it's so long, it's the, again, almost 30 miles in, that we, we actually went up 300 feet in elevation. So um, those people pay money to the boat drivers to get them out to the road. And then from the road, they have to get on a bus to get out of Panama. And that's about an eight to 10 hour drive uh, from this end of Panama to the other end of Panama, which is on the Costa Rican border. That costs $60. And uh, it, I think it's subsidized a bit because even that is kind of cheap, but they, uh, they come here to the camp. There's a camp just right over that way, back in the, in the distance over there, uh, beyond the plantains. And they, they sometimes stay at the camp for a day or two, but sometimes only for an hour or two. And they get fed, they get checked out by a medic, they register. <clears throat> and then they might have to wait around for a while until they can raise some more money and then they will head out toward the Costa Rican border. Again, eight to 10 hour bus ride from there 
it costs sixty dollars panama overall does not want these people to stay in panama in any way shape or form they don't want to keep them here it's very costly for panama to run these camps and there are quite a few of them at any given time there are probably 10 or 15,000 migrants in these camps across the Darien and over on the Costa Rican side and Panama has to feed all those people they have to provide them showers and toilets and medical care and food uh, I mean um, beds things like that so it, uh, last I heard Panama was spending like 14 million dollars a month just uh, you know feeding these migrants so Panama doesn't want this it's it's this Panama is a very small country only four million people uh, so it's it's a real drain on their resources to have to do this so their I their, their plan is to treat them like a hot potato throw them on a bus as quickly as possible and get them out of here and get them to Costa Rica Costa Rica for its part then does pretty much the same thing uh, they put they jump on a, a, a put these people on a bus and ship them to Nicaragua. Nicaragua does the same thing, puts them on a bus and ships them to Honduras. Honduras puts them on a bus to Guatemala. Guatemala puts them on a bus to the border of Mexico. Uh, before, uh, just recently, they would then get a transit visa in Mexico at the southern border in a town called Tapachula. And then they would have 15 days to transit through Mexico on buses, trains, whatever they could to get to the U.S. southern border. But just recently, uh, there has been apparently a deal struck between Joe Biden and Manuel Lopez Obrador, the president of um, uh, the, the president of Mexico. And we don't know the details of that deal, but the outgrowth of it is that Mexico has just sent a bunch of troops to its southern border to attempt to stop the flow of migration. Now, this has to do with the upcoming elections in the United States. Joe Biden has been getting crucified by the Republicans um, <clears throat> because of the, and rightly so, because of the insane number of people that are coming to the United States. And I just got my lunch, so I'm gonna eat lunch while I'm talking to you. Thank you, Matt. Um, so Joe Biden's been getting crucified for that. And obviously that stands to hurt his chances of reelection. So while they have done very little to deter illegal migration throughout his presidency, and in fact have done quite a bit to encourage it, um, now, at least for the time being, they're trying to slow the flow a little bit uh, in order to be able to claim that they're doing something about it before the election. I'm eating, this is my, my lunch here. I'm eating rice and beans with a little salad and some chicken. This is a typical Panamanian lunch and it's very good. So, uh, for the time being, the numbers are starting to drop coming through the Darien Gap. And that's because the people who are coming have probably a better handle on the news in the United States than you and I do. They don't get their news from watching the news. They get their news from WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups that share information uh, like an underground railroad among the different migrants. Um, and the migrants that have already made it at North put information as to what to do, where to go, who to talk to, what programs you can apply for, where the most lenient, you know, pro-migrant cities are in the U.S., et cetera, et cetera. And on the way up, what services you take for buses, where's the safest route, uh, if you don't want to get robbed, all things like that, okay? Um, so, um, the Biden administration is now kind of changing its tune because they're trying to beef up their uh, chances at re-election. And the people here sense that 
and it's starting to slow down a little bit. Up until just a week ago, there were something like 5,000 people every day coming through the Darien Gap. Now that's down to maybe a couple thousand a day, but even that is a massive, massive uh, number of people. And all of those people are heading to the United States. So let's talk about some of the kinds of people that I've met uh, in the last couple days as I've been reporting on this. Yesterday, I went out to the camp in Canaan Membrio. I say it's a camp, it's actually a, a Embera village. It's a um, indigenous tribe in Panama. And they live out in the jungle. They normally live very primitive lives. They live in thatch roof huts that are up on stilts. I'll show, if you wanna see some of this, uh, I'm gonna be putting video about this up on my YouTube channel at The Hot Zone with Chuck Holton. So you can go over to The Hot Zone with Chuck Holton, subscribe over there. When I put stuff up, you'll get notified. And you can see the, what I'm talking about. Um, when I went into the, to the village yesterday, Again, it's a four-hour drive up the mount, uh, up the uh, river in a dugout canoe. And then we get there. The camp is teeming with people. And most of them were from China because that particular route is the easier of the two routes. And Chinese people tend to have more money so they can pay to, you know, get some of the trip cut off by taking boats further and getting, you know, more rides and that sort of thing. So the, there were a ton of Chinese there. Many of those Chinese were, uh, ver I wouldn't say all of them, but many of them were military age males. Many of them had gang tattoos, Chinese gang tattoos, dragons and snakes and stuff. Uh, most are friendly and curious. They don't have any reason not to be. You can tell who the facilitators and coyotes are because they're the ones that are not friendly and courteous and, and don't want you taking pictures and will even come and demand that you delete the pictures, which I won't do. Uh, this is not their country. And so if some Chinese guy comes up to me and tells me to delete my pictures, I'm gonna tell him to take a hike because um, he doesn't have any authority here. I mean, imagine the, the hubris of breaking into a country illegally and then stomping around trying to tell people what to do. That's, that's some hubris for you. Um, but as I walked around, I also ran into uh, 40 or 50 people from Afghanistan. Now, this was very interesting. I've run into Afghans before coming in. And just imagine how many countries they have to go through to get to the Darien Gap. They go from Afghanistan to Iran, Iran to Turkey, Turkey to Brazil, Brazil to Colombia, Colombia to Panama. And then from Panama, they go all the way up through Mexico to the United States. Now, again, these guys are very friendly. They are I, I was amazed. They all spoke English and good English. And I thought, oh, you must have been translators for the US military. And they said, no, we just grew up with the military there. And everybody in Afghanistan speaks English now because the military was there for 20 years. And it was just sort of required to, to learn English, you know. But those guys, Some of them, most of them, had escaped Afghanistan years ago. And they've been living in Turkey, or they've been living in Europe, or they've been living in um, Iran for years, making a living, making a life. Uh, and so why do they need to come to the United States? They're not being persecuted in Europe. They're not being persecuted in Turkey. Well, when you question them about it, what it comes down to is I can make more money in the U.S. Um, 
think about this. That's not a cheap trip. I mean, could you could you afford to buy a ticket to Iran right now? Three thousand dollars. Well, these guys have to raise that money, and I talked to them about it, and they either get it by going there and working, saving money, and then buying their ticket, or they borrow money from family and then go. I'm in Panama. Uh, I'm in the. For those of you just joining, I'm in the Darien Gap in Panama. I'm um, not quite at the very southern end of the road, as far as you can drive south uh, in Panama, um, toward toward Colombia. I am about 45 minutes from there. We went down there this morning. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then we, we've come back now. We're back on, heading back to Panama City after lunch. So, I mean, you see it's very tropical. You can see how hot and sunburned I am. And you see the plantains hanging here. And hear the birds singing and stuff. It's obviously super tropical here and it looks beautiful but if you had to walk through this for six days and sleep on the ground and not have much food or clean water and swim through muddy rivers with the caiman crocodiles we saw a ton of caimans yesterday um obviously that that is going to change this this from a nice tropical uh, excursion to uh hell on earth it was pretty bad but that, these guys are willing to brave that because, again, they are going to the United States to make more money. All of them. Like, the, you, you might say, well, yeah, it's terrible in Afghanistan. I understand why they want to leave. Yes, but they left years ago. And even if they left yesterday, they've already traveled through a half a dozen countries that are not persecuting them where they could stop and make a life that's better than Afghanistan. So once you get to Colombia, let's say, and you could stay in Colombia and make a living, make a life, get a job, get, start a business, whatever you want. Well, if you move on beyond that, you're now an economic migrant. You're not an asylum seeker. That's just point, period, end of story. Now, as an American, if you went to Turkey you'd be amazed that, wow, you can actually have a pretty nice life living in Turkey. If you went to Iran, you'd say, this is terrible compared to America. But those people coming from Afghanistan to Iran, it's actually much better. So if it was just about escaping persecution and having a better life, they already did that. Now they're coming to America for a better paycheck. And this is the path that they're on to do it. Right in front of me, about 100 feet away, is the Pan American Highway. You can actually hear the cars going by on it. And the Pan American Highway is not a highway per se. It's a two lane road. I'll take you over there and show you here real quick. But, you know, we are down at the very end of the earth down here practically. So, um, we, we went up, we talked to these uh, Chinese people, there were tons of them, Afghan people, tons of them. I met people, from, tons of people from Venezuela as well, but they're the middle class Venezuelans, they're the wealthier ones. This morning, we went to the, the holding camps here along the road, and one of them holds the Chinese and the people, that's the one that's right over here. Literally behind this orange building is a, a camp with a bunch of migrants in it. Um, <clears throat> and that's where the wealthier, you know, ones go. The poorer ones go to a place called Puerto Limon, which is back that way, a couple miles. And it's pretty bad, um, pretty crowded. You, that's where you find Haitians, the poorer, you know, Venezuelans, um, I ran into a guy and inter interviewed him just now, a guy from Iran, an Iranian guy. And of course, that's a kind of a red flag, you know, when you see an Iranian here. Uh, and so I got talking to him, he actually spoke English. And as it turns out, he fled Iran like a long time ago. 
And he went and lived in Europe. And he lived in Germany, he lived in the Netherlands, he lived in Finland. He learned English and he converted to Christianity. After like 11 years, he went back to Iran to visit his family and then was unable to get, decided, well, you know, I'm gonna have to go through the same process because he was illegal the whole time. I have to go through the same process to get back to Europe. I might as well go for the United States this time. So he's on his way to the United States. And he, um, he left Iran, went to Turkey, there goes a UN agency. Uh, he left Iran, went to Turkey. He, um, I'm gonna turn the camera around and let you see this lady making chicken over here while I'm talking. I'll keep talking. Uh, let's see here. There we go. She's over there making chicken. Um, this guy left Iran, went to Turkey, went to Brazil, Colombia, walked through the Darien Gap and just got here to Panama. He's on his way to the United States. I also met a, a felon who had been deported from the United States, from Miami, and he had lived there for 12 years, so he spoke very good English. And he was just like, I'm gonna go back illegally because it's easier than trying to go legally. And um, he's not allowed to go back to the United States, but he is going to anyway. It's not uncommon and it's not difficult at all to find, um, a felon who has been deported from the United States that is on his way back. That's very common. Um, so I also ran into some gang members from Venezuela. You can tell by their tattoos. And then I just asked them and they, they admitted it and basically tried to shake me down and, and give me money or get, get me to give them money. Uh, they have to, uh, let's see, Bill, that's a great question. Let's see, what's your question, Bill? Let's see here. Let's see if I can find your question, Bill. I missed it. No. Sorry, Bill, you'll have to re-ask your question. Oh, wait. I lived in Virginia 30. No. No, I missed your question, Bill, sorry. Uh, so, uh, you know, these, these gang members, they wanted money. I told them where I come from, a real man doesn't ask for money from anybody. He works for his money. And I'm not gonna insult you by giving you money for nothing. They didn't like my answer very much. Um, let's see. I'm just watching the comments here, sorry. Why did I stop covering the Israel war? Well, I had to come home for a while and there are a lot of other conflicts in the world. That's not the only one. The Israel war is not really, I mean, there's a lot going on for sure. And because, let's see here. There's a, there's a lot going on in Israel. I could certainly be there covering that right now, but this is important too. And I had already committed to doing this. I'm with a group of people that wanted to go see it. And so I'm kind of playing tour guide here. Um, the group is, is eating over there in the restaurant. I just came over here to do this live for you. And we're, we're showing people around here. How can average people make a positive change? So that's a question that's beyond the scope of this live. Uh, as far as what they can do about this, about migration, well, it all comes down to how you vote. You could uh, definitely let your politicians know that you're not going to support bringing all these people in. See, there's a push factor and there's a pull factor. The push factor is whatever pushes them out of the country that they, they were born in. Um, that could be crime, it could be war, it could be poverty, it could be whatever. We're not responsible for that. But unless they live in Mexico or Canada, the pull factor is what brings them to the United States. And you have to ask yourself, what are the pull factors? What is it the US is doing 
that wants people, that, that makes people want to come to the United States? And of course, the, the answer most people give is, well, freedom, we have freedom. And I say, I hate to break it to you, but I've been around the world, more than a hundred countries, and uh, there are places in the world that are much freer than the United States anymore. Now, not, I'm not saying the U.S. is irredeemable, but I'm saying that if you wanted freedom, you don't have to choose the United States to do it. Uh, the, the real reason, and actually I just had this conversation with a Venezuelan guy today, the real reason is not because America is the land of the free. It's because America is doing socialism better than the socialist countries at the moment. I say at the moment because that will only continue while America is able to spend other people's money. When it runs out of other people's money, then it's not gonna be able to do this anymore. But right now, our systems have not completely collapsed and so the healthcare system, if you're an illegal migrant, you can go and you can you hear that bus going by? That's a bus full of migrants that's leaving. If you live in, if you enter the United States illegally, you can go to the hospital and you can get treated for free. You don't have to pay your bill. Um, and that's why a lot of hospitals are going bankrupt because there are so many people doing that. If you want to put your kids in school, you don't have to be a citizen. You don't have to pay. You can send your kids to school for free. Here in Panama, even if you are a citizen, there is compulsory public school but it's not free. More buses full of migrants. Uh, the, the, you know, the schooling is not free here in Panama. It's not free in most places in the world. You still have to buy your notebooks and you have to buy all your materials. And you have to buy uniforms and you know, all that stuff. Um, so even people here in Panama kind of scratch their heads when you tell them you can go to school in the United States and not pay a penny. And they go, what, really? Like, how does that work? Uh, you know, so even beyond healthcare and, uh, and schooling, we have tons of programs, uh, social welfare programs, federal programs, church programs, state, municipal programs, city programs that will feed you, clothe you, house you, uh, and even give you money for spending. If you're a migrant, that process of receiving something for nothing from the United States doesn't start when you cross the border into the United States. It starts when you leave your own country and cross and, and begin your journey to the United States because there's this organization called the IOM, the International Organization for Migration. Listen to that, for migration, as in pro-migration partially funded by the United States taxpayer and partially funded by George Soros and other donors. And the IOM, along with other organizations, will literally set up a tent at the border between Venezuela and Colombia and ha hand out debit cards to the people coming across that have money on it that will help them get to the next place where there's a tent set up that will give them another card and that, so on and so forth all the way up to the United States. They are being paid, or at least their trip is largely being paid for by taxpayers and others uh, in many cases. So, why wouldn't you do that? I mean, you can't, you can't blame the migrants for taking what's being handed to them. I can't blame them for that. If somebody, look, I love cookies. If somebody's standing on a street corner handing out cookies, don't blame me for getting in line. But the problem is that when you feed the ducks, you get more ducks. And so that's why we keep seeing the numbers going up and up and up and up and up. It's not the push factors that are making people want to leave where they were born. It's the pull factors that are causing them to want to come to the United States and not be happy living in Nicaragua, Guatemala, Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, so anywhere else. That's why. So, folks, if you want to 
support the reporting that I do, you can do that here on CBN by giving to CBN. Go to CBN.com. And we highly appreciate that. We make good use of it. Uh, I'm going to continue to cover the war in Israel. I'm going to continue to cover the other conflicts around the world as well. And, um, you know, you, we, we appreciate that. So please do that at the very least. Subscribe here on YouTube. And go check if you already subscribed because they've been unsubscribing people. And um, also go over to the hot zone with Chuck Holton and subscribe over there while you're at it. You can also go to chuckholton.com. I put a lot of articles and photographs and updates and stuff that aren't videos that go on YouTube over at chuckholton.com. So you can keep track of where I am, what I'm doing, how things are going by subscribing over there, chuckholton.com. So, uh, I, I've told you about the Chinese, I told you about the Afghans, I told you about the Venezuelans, I told you about the um, Iranian guy that I met today. And we met some Ethiopians right here at the beginning of the video. Uh, the, so uh, that just gives you a, a cross section of the kind of people who are coming to uh, Panama on their way to the United States. Uh, now, I'm gonna set my lunch aside for a minute and I'm going to turn the camera around and I'm going to walk you around and show you a little bit, just a very little bit for a second, about what this looks like where I am. Because again, there's a refugee camp, or a refugee camp, there's a migrant camp right behind this re orange building. Pan American Highway's out this way. And I'll explain all that here in a second. So let me turn this camera around. You can watch this lady chopping up Costilla. And she's whacking up spare ribs there. Wow. Cuídate los dedos. No, está bien. Okay, we're going to walk over here. That's what we call a just kill me dog. It's so hot out here, he lays on the ground and says, please just kill me. And I can relate. So over here is the Pan American Highway. And that's, and it, 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 look, it look, look at that here. That was just before I found the cannibal, like a week ago. So we got Pan American Highway here. And uh, when I say Pan American Highway, you might think American Highway, like, like we have in America. Well, as you can see here, this is not a highway in any real sense this far south. Again, uh, that, that's looking, heading actually west. Nor Panama actually goes east-west. It doesn't go north-south. Because the, if you look at the map, the isthmus kind of turns. But, so that goes toward Costa Rica, about 10 hours drive that direction. And about 45 minutes drive that direction, the road just ends into the Rio Chukunake in a place called Yavisa. Okay? Uh, and this is the Pan American Highway. This is the route. This is the, the pipeline that these migrants come down uh, to go to the United States. They come from this direction. They get on buses, which I'll show you right now and they go that direction toward America. They go right down there. Uh, right over here, back in the distance back there, I'm not gonna walk all the way down there because it's a long way and they'll kick me out if I go down there right now. You have to get permission to enter those camps. But you can see the buses right here. There are buses actually lined up down this road See the bus, all the buses there. And then over there are tents with, I can, I, from where I'm standing, I can see lines of thousands of migrants. The, that entire length of those tents, and they're about four deep, is a, a line after line after line of migrants, mostly Chinese migrants.
in there uh, on this particular camp. <clears throat> we have lots of video of that. And I'll be putting that video up on my website, chuckholton.com, or over on the Hot Zone uh, here on YouTube. Uh, but <coughs> that's the camp, one of them. There are multiple camps uh, because there are far too many, and they're actually building more <laughs> with help from the United States. Uh, so the United States has essentially become one of the traffickers in this uh, whole process because anything, anybody who pays to help the migrants get where they're going uh, in, uh, in this process is a smuggler. So that's why I don't donate money when the migrants ask me for money uh, because I don't want to be a smuggler. I don't give them rides. Um, you know, I'll be kind to them and if they're in a medical emergency, I'll certainly help them with that. But uh, I, I don't help them uh, in any material way that would help them get closer to their goal because I don't want to help them break the law in the United States. So back here, uh, there is actually a back entrance to this camp, but I, again, I can't go all the way back there. Um, so that gives you a sense of what it's like here in the Darien. Uh, I'll be making some news packages about this uh, that will air on CBN in a week or two. So stay tuned for that. I will also be putting uh, you know, a lot more of this video that I've been shooting in the last few days, uh, going up the river in a dugout canoe and seeing the migrants, interviewing the migrants. I'll be putting that stuff up on my website over there. So again, you might want to go see that. Uh, here's a better shot of the buses that are lined up waiting to take the migrants to the Costa Rican border. Again, that's an overnight drive. It's about eight to 10 hours on these buses and they leave here and go directly through Panama City and across the Panama Canal and then go all the way to Costa Rica. They, would, they, they barely stop at all because they do not want these migrants here in Panama. It's just a big game of hot potato. Uh, nobody wants them until they get to the United States. So that's all I've got. Uh, I've, I've got to get on the road. We're gonna head back to Panama City. I just wanted to give you a sense of what we've been doing and I'm melting out here, so I'm gonna go get in the car where there's some air conditioning. <laughs> uh, thank you for watching. I'm sorry I can't really read the comments very well in the sun here, but uh, I really appreciate all of you who are watching. Please like and share the podcast. Share this with your friends. This is the kind of news that people want nowadays uh, because it's very real. You know, I'm not showing you anything that's edited and filtered or anything. You're getting to see exactly what I see when we do these lives like this. And uh, so if you like that, please like it and share it with your friends. Uh, so God bless you. I'll see you again soon.